Designers generally do. A lot of them come from the realm of, these days, electrical engineering backgrounds, RF backgrounds. Um, even their, their design side, they'll have, their layout people will have a lot of physics backgrounds. And uh, it's, it's more an issue in understanding, in some of the cases, of communicating their interests and needs to fabricators and fabricators communicating back what the tolerances are, what, what are the things that are going to change in the fabrication process because it's actually kind of the reverse uh, in a way of fabricators are making changes to a board that affects the designers. The designers that the designers haven't communicated are important things to the fabricator. Um, and so that's, uh, we have some field solving tools that designers have been primarily using for a long time uh, that are a few steps above what the fabricators have been using, but we've seen a significant growth in that for fabricators stepping into looking at things like copper roughness, um, changing dielectric values, how that's affecting the insertion loss, uh, that as the designers are stepping into the realm and the fabricators are stepping into the realm of the low loss laminates, now things like slight variations in the widths of the trace due to edge factor and copper roughness have significant impacts now on uh, what the designers are interested in and that's beyond impedance. You're still 50 ohms, you still get that uh, target impedance but changes elsewhere might make it so the signal's not getting through anymore. Well it's interesting because how, looking and saying how much do the designers need to know about the physics of, of what's going on. That's a loaded question because the answer is yes, they need to know what's going on so that they can make intelligent design choices uh, about trace widths. It's more than just fitting all of the traces into the board to connect the chips because uh, they could do really wide traces or really narrow traces and still achieve all the connections they're looking for. Um, but if that's you know, now taking out their uh, their impedances aren't matching, or the impedances are matching, but referencing to what I said before about insertion loss uh, due to copper roughness, you might not have a signal coming out the other end, but you were able to lay it all out. So the more a designer understands, and, and likewise, the more a fabricator understands the physics of what's going on, enables them to make intelligent design choices and for what's going to actually be manufactured. Because when it comes down to uh, things like various copper, I'm going to keep saying copper roughness elements because that's really a, a key thing these days um, that we hear from designers in being able to get the, the right copper roughness out of their factory, uh, the fabricator that they're using, uh, fundamentally comes down to communicating that because if that's not understood by both parties of why it's significant, things can go awry. And I've heard that from a num number of designers in the Bay Area recently about that. Eric Bogdan is famous for saying it depends. Based off the application, the materials that are going into that stack up, um, because if, if the designer has set out their design to have a sufficient loss budget that they can use uh, RTF foil, then that might work for them. Uh, in other cases, they might need VLP or HVLP or you name the, the copper roughness uh, value out of the different uh, laminate suppliers and copper foil suppliers that they'll, so th those have different roughness values and it's kind of a, a growing issue of trying to understand and characterize that. And that's why tools like our SI9000, you can actually plug that in and see where the insertion loss is starting to drop off uh, at, at different frequency ranges. So as you go up in frequency, and that's really the key thing, as a lot of designers are stepping into PAM4 and they're, they're shooting for targets of 40 and 50 gigahertz for their designs, copper roughness is now uh, the issue that the industry is looking at. Um, partially because most, most factories that they're working with in that gigahertz range already have good tight controlled impedance traces. They're able to manage uh, the, the pressing, the etching factors, and so now it's stepping into what are the next things that the factory can do to improve quality and uh, get the customer what they're looking to build. In both in the modeling and the measurement side, 
uh, Polar Instruments has tools for like the SI9000 is our field solver. Uh, and then when that's paired with SpeedStack, uh, our stack up tool, um, we can then send those structures the designer puts into their stack up. The factory can get that, use our CGen tool uh, for coupon generating to actually create insertion loss coupons as well as impedance coupons. And then we also actually, we call it completing the loop of then going on into our hardware test tools that uh, you've heard of the SITS. Uh, we also have an Atlas line, which it does uh, insertion loss testing. So we have a number of factories in the US and in Asia who have this set of equipment so they can model, uh, model the structures so they know what's going to happen ahead of time, build it, test it, and then take that data and information and put it back into the tools for post-fabrication analysis. So after you do a cross-section of that coupon, put those values in, model it out, take the measurement value, put that into the tool, and compare on the same screen the two, uh, the modeled versus the measured, to see you know, maybe this was an issue of overetching, underetching, uh, we have a different copper roughness value going on here, uh, or we have the wrong values for something, because that's that's the key thing of taking modeling and measured uh, values and getting them to connect uh, and understanding what's going on. But we, we do have a, a complete suite of tools for impedance and insertion loss. We don't like at Polar to limit what designers and fabricators are doing. We're very much, we're trying to equip you so you have the most flexible tool set. And to answer that of how, how do we accommodate those different roughness um, characteristics and putting them into the tool. Uh, there have been a number of methods that we, we're not making up our own in these. We're implementing accepted industry methods. Um, we started with Hammerstad. We had that in our tool set for a long time. We added Groys uh, and we added Hire. Hire is the, the one that a lot of people had a focus on and interest in recently because it, unlike the other two, it didn't have a saturation value where there was a limit within uh, that formula and Hirei doesn't have that and Hirei also when he came up with this method was looking at saying let's let's actually do the physics modeling of this instead of just coming back from empirical measurements let's do the physics modeling let's do the empirical measurements let's bring those together to come up with a, a more complete method the slight problem with that is it's fairly complex to get the values in to put that into uh, a tool set so we worked with uh, some other industry experts to sort of simplify that in a uh, what's called the cannonball, cannonball, hold on, cannonball stack here method. Uh, it's just doing some simple math to convert the values that the fabricators already have of what the roughness values are and put it into that model. Now it's not perfect, uh, but so it, it, it's a method that does it quickly and gets gets a really, really good answer. Um, I've talked to designers when I, I pulled this information from a factory, and they said, this is what the, the roughness values are. I gave that to the designer, sight unseen, not knowing anything else that he was doing. He plugged it in, and he was shocked because he called me back and said, or, do you have like a spy in my office? Because the value I gave him back, when he put it, put it into the field solver at 13 gigahertz, he was, uh, let's see, it was, 0 0.01 dB per inch difference from what he measured. Solid. Yeah. So the, the modeling and the measuring are really coming together these days. And that's, that's beneficial for designers and fabricators because now we're able to push those frequency ranges and get the products through without a bunch of scrap, without redesigns. And uh, so that's reducing cost and increasing throughput for, for everybody. So uh, we consider that a win all the way around. Separating the losses from the measurement tends to actually be a fairly complicated uh, analysis that needs to be done. Because in order to do that, you need to fully understand the, model. the models, but you also need to fully understand what's going on with the materials. And because in the measurement by nature itself, all of those losses are lumped together. And so in order to uh, pull out one from it, it it's kind of like making Kool-Aid uh, or uh, you know Gatorade or something. You pour in the, the mix, you stir it up, and now you're saying, I would like to separate the water from that. Well, 
it, it, it'll take some time because you need to know what those chemicals are that are in there right now and you can't go through that process. Uh, and the process would be doing a cross-section, characterizing the, so you know what the dimensions are solidly on that, uh, doing some other measurements of how the dielectric materials are behaving, their losses, the losses of the conductors, and if you're able to identify all those pieces out, you can then take that and apply it to the next case over and say, well, we're pretty sure this is what the dielectric losses are here. We're pretty sure what, what these values are uh, over here just from the nature of the conductor. So these additional losses probably are due to the roughness. But I'm thinking, I just spoke with an industry expert a couple weeks ago, and he was looking and saying, the copper roughness wouldn't account for this additional loss that we're experiencing. And it had to do with water uh, coming into the board and, and causing some additional issues there. It's hard for fabricators and designers to recognize that it, there's a lot, well, I don't think fabricators have this problem. There's a lot of art in this science that we do. Yeah, th that's a really large question. Insertion loss coupons really fundamentally aren't that different from impedance coupons. Sometimes they can, not always. And that's where it, you asked a really kind of big question there. Most of the time they do use different landings and different connectors, but that has to do with the frequency range of those connectors and uh, the landing, you know, the, the connection onto the board that you're looking for. Because you don't want to be measuring the additional losses due to the probe. You want to be measuring what's on the board. And so there are, uh, thinking of, like industry standard, well not standards, industry methods from IPC like SPP, set to DIL, Delta L which is being rebranded as the eigenvalue method. Um, those actually all come from, uh, believe it or not, the design side. The, it's the designers who then stepped in and said, fabricators, we need, a, we need this information from you. And so it was the designers, the Intels, the IBMs, uh, pushing downstream to the factory saying we want you guys to use these methods because we need this information so that we can make informed decisions and also quality control to know what's coming in and out. Now all those methods use uh, different landing patterns and styles to connect the, to the board. And in some cases they don't even uh, spec specifically how it should be connected. Um, so when it comes to insertion loss coupons it's uh, it's one of those of talk to your fa designer should talk to their fabricator um, or fabricator talk to your designer of what they're specifically looking for in regards to uh, what type of insertion loss measurement and what the expectations are and then also talking to the tool supplier uh, so like if you give me a call uh, within CGen we have those patterns we have the coupon designs uh, so it's uh, just a few clicks to bringing that in yeah, we have uh, a suite called Atlas. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a suite, so it's hardware and software uh, paired together for doing insertion loss measurements. And we've had that for a number of years now, uh, going back to 2012, and maybe even earlier. The tool set of what the frequency it covers is based off of the hardware package uh, that it's connected into. Most of the time, we do a range of uh, 0 to 20 gigahertz, um, but I also know there's customers out there who are doing 0 to 50 gigahertz. We don't really go much, much further past that with our tool suite in there. Um, we do direct people to, to others, other tool suppliers when it's appropriate. I'm confident in saying that we build relationships, we build partnerships with other tool suppliers, with our customers, and we really have a heart for uh, helping our customers solve their problems. Uh, our, our company is primarily made up of engineers, um, and so we, ha we have that hard focus of we're here to help you solve problems, and we don't want to be a problem for you in that regard. So as much as we can come alongside our customers, uh, both on the design side and the fab side, where practically where I s we see that going is a lot more into the things like copper roughness, insertion loss. Uh, we, we were there supporting uh, the fabricators when impedance started, started becoming uh, an issue. Um, and as much as Ken uh, was around back in the day to help designer, er, help fabricators, um, 
now we're embracing that of uh, helping designers and fabricators stepping into the realm of uh, increasing frequencies and insertion loss.